William Norton's Introduction Part 2 Proof that very few Israelites in the time of Christ understood Greek. Some have supposed that the language of Palestine in the time of Christ was either wholly or in part Greek. Professor A. Neubauer, Neubauer reader in Rabbinical Hebrew in Oxford University, published in Studia Biblica an essay on the dialects spoken in Palestine in the time of Christ. He says that Isaac Voss, who died in 1689, was the first who supposed that Greek was the only language spoken in Palestine after Alexander after Alexander the Great, that Diodati in 1767 closely followed Voss and sought to prove that Greek was the mother language of the Jews in the time of Jesus, that Professor Paulus of Jena in 1803 held that an Aramaic dialect was then the current language of the Jews in Palestine, but that Jesus and his disciples had no difficulty in using Greek in their public speeches when they found it convenient to do so. That Dr. Alexander Roberts, professor of humanity in St. Andrew's University and a member of the Company of Revisers of the NC Scriptures, published in 1881, contends that Christ spoke for the most part in Greek and only now and then in Aramaic. Dr. Roberts published in 1859 a work in which he discussed the question relating to the language of Palestine in the time of Christ. At page 62, he said that he thought he had proved that Greek and not Hebrew was the common language of religious address in Palestine in the days of Christ and his apostles. He said at page 63, Christ spoke in Greek, and his disciples did the same when they reported what he said. Their inspiration consisted not, as some have deemed, in being enabled to give perfect translations either of discourses delivered or of documents written in the Aramaic language, but in being led under infallible guidance to transfer to paper for the benefit of all coming ages those words of the great teacher which they had heard from his lips in the Greek tongue. Few at present are of Dr. Robert's opinion, the question does not affect the inspiration of the Greek text, but it has a very important bearing on the value of the Peshito Syriac books of the New Covenant. Professor Neubauer's familiarity with the Jewish writings of that time enables him to discuss the subject with much fullness and force. He gives the following probabilities as the result of his own examination of the subject, that in the time of Christ, the Galileans understood their own Syriac dialect only, together with a few current expressions in ancient Hebrew, that in Jerusalem, a modernized Hebrew and a purer Syriac dialect than that of Galilee were in use among the majority of the Jews and that the small Jewish-Greek colony there and a few privileged persons spoke a Judeo-Greek jargon. He says that the Syrian dialect of Galilee was the popular language and that it is the language which is called in the New Covenant Hebrew, John verse 2, and is called by Josephus, and in the Apocrypha, the language of the country, that 
It was in this dialect that Josephus at first wrote his historical work on the war, that the Syriac words which are recorded in the Greek and C scriptures prove that this was a distinct dialect in some respects from the Syriac of the Syrians, and yet was so like it that Josephus says the Jews could understand the Syrians. Professor Neubauer has no doubt that the language used by Jesus was the popular Galilean Syriac dialect, and that in the Greek text we have only a Greek translation of the words which he uttered. He says, Jesus, as is now generally admitted, addressed himself to his disciples and to his audience in the popular dialect. This appears not only from the Aramaic words left in the Gospels by the Greek translators, but more especially from his last words on the cross, which were spoken under circumstances of exhaustion and pain, when a person would naturally make use of his mother tongue, and from the fact that it is mentioned that he spoke to Paul in Hebrew, Acts 26.14. The Jews so little knew Greek, and so much less cared to know it, that Paul, in order to gain a hearing, was obliged to speak to them in their Aramaic dialect. How would the Medes, Elamites, and Arabians have understood Peter at Pentecost if he had spoken Greek? to the men of Judea and all who dwelt in Jerusalem. Professor Neubauer gives many reasons for his belief that few Jews in Palestine had a substantial knowledge of Greek. One of them is that no events had occurred which could have made Greek prominent in Palestine, that no nation over makes so great a change in its language as to adopt a totally different one, unless the conqueror transports the greater part of the inhabitants and introduces foreign colonists who are far more numerous than the remaining inhabitants, and that the Greeks had never this superiority of numbers in Palestine. He says that few Greek words occur in the Jewish writings, such as the Mishnah, the Targums, and the Talmud of Jerusalem, that no apocryphal book, as far as our knowledge goes, was composed in Greek by a Palestinian Jew, that, so far as he can judge, all that the Jews in Palestine learned of Greek was at most a few sentences sufficient to enable them to carry on trade and to hold intercourse with the lower officials, and that even this minimum certainly ceased after the Maccabean victory over Antiochus Epiphanes, because it was the interest of the Asmonian princes to keep the Jews aloof from the influence of the neighboring dialect. Professor Neubauer thinks that those Hebrews who lived in cities occupied chiefly by Greeks may have acquired a fair knowledge of conversational Greek, but not to such an extent as to enable them to speak it in public. He says that even those Jews of Egypt and Asia Minor who spoke Greek maintained a connection with the motherland by going to Jerusalem for feast days, and that we may infer that they all still spoke, more or less, their native Hebrew dialect, because no mention is made of interpreters being required for them, either in the temple or outside of it. The Greek translation of the Old Covenant, Hebrew... <coughs> Sorry, the, the Greek translation of the Old Covenant Hebrew scriptures called the Septuagint 
which was made in Egypt, existed in the time of Christ. But Professor Neubauer says, We may boldly state that this Greek translation of the Bible was unknown in Palestine, except to men of the schools, and perhaps a few of the Hellenistic Jews. It is said in the Talmud that when the Greek translation of the Seventy appeared, there came darkness upon the earth, and that the day was as unfortunate for Israel as that on which the golden calf was made. The fact that the Jews at Jerusalem who spoke Greek are called Hellenists, that is, Grecians, in Acts 6, 1 and 9, 29, shows that their Greek speech made them a peculiar class quite distinct from the rest of the people. In Antioch of Syria, though it was a celebrated Greek city, Syriac, as well as Greek, continued to be spoken. Profe Professor Neubauer says, Antioch and other Syrian towns would not give up Syriac. He says also, Had Greek been generally spoken and taught, why should the Talmud record a general exception in favor of Gamaliel, and later, in the second century, in favor of the family of Judah the saint, the redactor of the Mishnah, a decision that they should be allowed to learn Greek because they had to conduct negotiations with the government. The Greek scriptures record some of the exact words used by Jesus. Many of these are words which were used only in Syriac dialects. This fact is often referred to as proof that Christ spoke in Syriac. Walton in the 13th of his prolegom Prolegomens, says, There are many purely Syriac words left in the Greek New Testament, which cannot be explained without a knowledge of Syriac, as Raka, Matthew 5, 22, Momuno, Riches, 6.24 Bar de Yanu, son, son of a dove, 16.17 Corbono, offering, Mark 7.11 Shebaktoni, thou, ha, thou hast forsaken me, Matthew twenty seven forty six Benai Regesh Sons of Thunder Mark three seventeen Talito Kumi Damsel Arise Mark five forty one Kakel Dero The Field of Blood Acts one nineteen Many others occur in Acts 5, 1, 9, 36, John 1, 47, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Moron Eto, Our Lord Has Come, and elsewhere. Indeed, Jesus, the name of our Lord, is Syriac for Savior, the name Messiah, is also Syriac, meaning anointed. The writers of the New Covenant first made known the heavenly words to the Jews and to other surrounding populations in this their native tongue, and afterwards wrote in the Greek language, but in doing so retain everywhere a flavor of Syriac. Professor Neubauer says, With reference to 1 Corinthians 16.22, written to Greeks, Is not the watchword, Moron Eto, Our Lord has come? 
which passed to Greek-speaking populations a sufficient proof that the speech of the first Christians was Aramaic? A still more decisive proof that it was so occurs in a remark made by Luke. He, guided by God's Spirit, said that the word akeldama in the Peshito Kekuldemo, the field of blood, was part of the language commonly used in Jerusalem. There is no such word as kekal, field, in ancient Hebrew. The only languages in which Castle, in his lexicon of the six related languages, Hebrew, Chaldee, Syriac, Samaritan, Ethiopic, and Arabic, says it occurs are Chaldi, Syriac, and Arabic. It does not occur in Gesenius's lexicon of ancient Hebrew. When, therefore, Luke says, and it became known to all the dwellers in Jerusalem, insomuch that in their language that field is called a keldama, that is, the field of blood, Acts one nineteen, We have infallible proof that the Syriac language was the language of Jerusalem. Josephus is a witness of very great importance on this subject also. He was so perfectly familiar with the state of things in Palestine in the first century and took such care to give correct information that his testimony has great weight. At the end of his antiquities, written in Greek, he said, I am bold to say that no other person, whether a Jew or of another race, would have been able, had he wished, to produce this work for Greeks so accurately. For I am admitted by my own countrymen to excel them far in the learning of our country, and I have applied myself with diligence to obtain a knowledge of Greek literature. For among us, those are not esteemed who learn the languages of many nations, but testimony for wisdom is given to those only who understand well our laws and are able to explain the meaning of the sacred writings. For this reason, out of the many who have toiled at this endeavor, scarcely some two or three have succeeded well. This testimony of the most learned and reliable of unconverted Jews is proof how few Jews had much knowledge of the Greek language. Another proof of this is what he relates of the time when he was a captive in the Roman army on the outside of Jerusalem. In defending himself against Apion, Book 1, he says that he presented his Greek history of the Jewish war to the chief commanders Vespasian and Titus and to many Romans who were in the war, and that these all bore testimony to his truthfulness. They all therefore knew Greek, and would have understood what those Jews who came out of the city and surrounded themselves said, if these could have spoken only a few words of Greek. But Josephus says, The things told by those who surrendered themselves only I understood. It is impossible, therefore, that the Jews of Palestine and Jerusalem could have understood either the Redeemer or his apostles if they had spoken to them in Greek or in any other language but that which Josephus calls the language of his own country at that time, a dialect of the widely spread Syriac language. The conclusion to which such a concurrence of evidence leads is that Syriac was unquestionably the language commonly spoken in Palestine in the time of Christ. 
and that very few Jews had a good knowledge of Greek. This conclusion leads almost of necessity to another, namely, that there must have been some provision in writing made by the apostles for the use of that large body of Christians who knew no language well but Syriac. Whatever was revealed as the will of God, whether written at first in Syriac or in Greek, was to be taught, not to the Jews only, nor to the Gentiles only, but to all disciples everywhere, that all might know it, and all be guided by it. Peter, writing to Hebrews, said, Second Epistle 115, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my disease to have these things always in remembrance. This could only be done by writing. The apostles knew well, and must have remembered as Peter did, that what they had taught by voice would soon be unknown to most, unless the disciples were well supplied with it in writing. They must all, of necessity, have had Peter's desire. They must have wished to make provision that what they taught by revelation to some one church might be known to all churches, not only while they lived, but after they were dead. Paul, who was willing to be made a curse with view to the salvation of the Hebrews, must have desired that what was revealed to him for the guidance of Greeks should be known also to Hebrews, and that it was known to Hebrews in his lifetime appears from the remark of Peter, who labored chiefly among Hebrews, and who, when writing to Hebrews, speaks of all Paul's letters as well-known writings. In his second epistle, 3.16, he says of Paul, As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which those who are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. His words imply that all Paul's letters had been extensively read by Hebrew Christians, and that they were treated with the same supreme regard as the other scriptures. They cannot, they cannot have been read by more than a few of the Hebrews in Greek. It seems almost certain that there must have been some Syriac translation. Such considerations as these prepare us to receive readily whatever proof may exist that Greek was not the only language in which the apostles left written records of God's will. Tremelius, a Christian Jew, who was a professor in the University of Heidelberg and who published, in 1569, an edition of the N.C. Peshito, contended that unless God loved foreigners more than Jews, he must have provided these, as well as the Greeks, with the inspired writings in their own tongues. He said that it seemed to be wholly in accord with truth that at the very beginning of the Church of Christ, the Syriac version was made either by the apostles themselves or by their disciples, unless either... Sorry, unless indeed we prefer to suspect that, in writing, they intended to have regard for foreigners only, and to have either no regard, or certainly very little, for those of their own nation. We know that the apostles, instead of showing less regard for the Jews than for the Gentiles, all, always went to the Jews first and showed a surpassing regard for their welfare. It seems to be extremely probable that Paul himself took care that most of his epistles should be written in Syriac as well as in Greek, 
so as to inform his own countrymen everywhere of whatever was revealed to him for the guidance of all Christians throughout the world. And the next video I will continue with part 3. The difference between the Syriac of the Peshito Syriac text and the popular Syriac dialect of Palestine.